A funny thing happened on the way here to Pimlico. What if they threw this horse race and no Kentucky Derby also ran, showed up? Well, Mage may not have looked invincible on the tote board nearly two weeks ago at Churchill Downs, not at 15 to 1. But lo and behold, he won the race, and he's the only Derby horse who showed up for the Preakness. The only other time that's happened in the 81 years since the Derby uh, was uh, was put in a place that would be before the Preakness, actually 91 years, do the math, Ron, 1932, was 1948 when Citation Blue passed three new shooters on his way to the Triple Crown and the only Triple Crown for a quarter century after that. The last two times, only eight horses were in the Preakness, 2015 and 2018. Uh, you may remember American Pharaoh and Justify from those years. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'm wearing my Kentucky Derby 2015 shirt. Uh, no adjustment of your seats behind me is necessary. Yes, I'm not this disjointed head against the blue background. Okay, but enough about that. If Mage does not win Saturday, a new shooter will have his colors painted on the infield weather vane for the fourth year in a row. That's how many non-derby horses won the Preakness in 36 runnings between 1984 and 2019. The times, they are a change, but you could also say they're back to what they used to be. We'll get into that. History aside, though, we're really going to get in to the eight horses who will be in the second Triple Crown race of 2023. Let me introduce a man, the only man I know who makes excuses for winning. He had a futures ticket on Mage, catch, uh, cashing at 100 to 1, as he told us, for value only. Uh, coming to us from Carlsbad, California, the director of DraftKings Sportsbook, Johnny Avello. Good morning, Ron and gentlemen. Uh, good to be morning, with Ron. you for the second leg of uh, the Triple Crown. And Ron, you, you know, it, this is a tough race for horses to come back a couple of weeks later. As two fills ran a great derby race, and they've decided not to run in this one because it's a little tough on the horse. And I think a lot of others felt that way, too. Uh, and maybe this track does not suit their running style. Yeah, and, and here we are with just the one plus seven new shooters. Back in Louisville, here is our handicapper par excellence licking his wounds from the Derby. You'll find him on social media at EJXD2. That translates to Ed DeRosa. What, what are your wash-up thoughts on the Derby going into the Preakness, Ed? Yeah, licking my wounds, but reloading the ADW. So we'll be uh, we'll be firing away to, to get it back. Uh, I was just wrong. Uh, I planted my flag on the uh you know, Apollo slash justify curse, so to speak. Uh, I was a believer that racing it too mattered. And in this case, Mage was just better. Uh, the, the figures lined up with that. I chose to ignore him at 15 to one. And I guess I have to ignore him again now that he's going to be six to five, but uh, he earned it. He's a worthy favorite, but I'm looking forward to gambling a little bit to try to beat him again at a better price. Yeah, I think you're right about that six to five possibility. Eight to five morning line already down to seven to five in Las Vegas. And I think six to five is what he's going to be looking at or right in that neighborhood. Let's yeah. find out from a guy who decided, I, I think I heard a birdie tell me that he did have a shekel or two on Mage in some way, shape or form at the Kentucky Derby the boss at Horse Racing Nation, Mark Midland. Is that true? The rumor's true? The rumor yeah. was great during the Kentucky Derby, Mark. That has to be true. That's what, yeah. I was, you know, I was on this horse, and then I was kind of off him a little bit. And then I got, I especially with Forte out, there just, there weren't that many options in there. And actually, Skinner was another horse that I talked about on, on this pod. And so with the two of them out, I just, kind of came back to disarm was my top choice and then mage kind of fell in as the second or third choice so uh got lucky hit that pick five a couple times and so that was a nice little bonanza for uh for derby but uh yeah and yeah, just I've, i went back and listened to this pod unfortunately i think this pod was in the time that i was kind of down a little bit and uh you know it, i was a little down that they weren't working the horse out of the gate more uh they did send him to the gate once only uh, I did talk to a couple of people from the, you know, trainer types that said, you know, that's usually all that's needed. Once you send a horse to the gate and they figure it out, then if it goes well, you just kind of move on. Um, but uh, it didn't matter. And he didn't even break well. That right. Yeah. And, and close he did to win the Kentucky Derby. And so we will talk about all the factors that come here in the Preakness. Will there be speed here? We didn't know if there was going to be in the Derby. It turned out to be. What about with only eight horses here? We'll get into that here as we'll go one by one through the 
Preakness Field. But let's go ahead and maybe give you a, a second screen to look at or a, another tool to look at. Mark, the super screener is back as usual for a big race. So what can we look for from the super screener at picks.horseracingnation.com? I mean, super screener is just an invaluable tool for these big races. And really, uh, it's a great product every Saturday. But, uh, you know, for example, with the Scratch of Forte uh, super screener email, uh, readers all got an email Saturday morning that said, OK, move Mage up, move him into the top group of choices, replace uh, Forte with Mage, uh, resulted in, in, in a ton of winning tickets. And, uh, you know, even for a race like the Preakness, that's fairly chalky. There's uh, a lot of rules that you can kind of follow and some horses that you can toss and uh, it can really help you get down to those really tight, you know, trifectas or superfectas, which are kind of have to do to make money in a race like this. And even more so the black eyed Susan, which we'll talk about later is a really great betting race. Uh, Super screeners got some really nice takes on the black eyed Susan. So uh, grab a copy. And uh, I think that's a race we can, we'll talk about later, but we can all uh, make a little bit of money. on. Proven system for Preakness picks based on years of analysis and results to narrow down the fields and show you what's important, what's not when handicapping showcase graded stakes races every weekend and they don't get bigger than the classics. We look for the bad favorites normally, you know, okay, is that the case with Mage? Well, why don't you find out what Mike Shuddy has to say about that? Log on to picks, P I C K S, picks.horseracingnation.com. Look for Super Screener. It has its own section available and you can find a package to suit you, whether it's for just this race, or maybe you want to go ahead and get, make a commitment year long. Why wouldn't you? It's the super screener and it's available to you only at picks.horseracingnation.com. Ron Flatter here at Pimlico, Johnny Avello in California, Mark Midland, Ed DeRosa in Kentucky. Let's go ahead and start to go through the field from the rail out for Preakness number 148 a mile and three sixteenths on what's expected to be a good weather day. 30% chance of a shower. Uh, we saw how right they were with the weather at Churchill Downs. <coughs> Let's get to National Treasure, the number one horse at the Preakness. 7.01, by the way, p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on NBC. National Treasure comes in for Bob Baffert. Baffert with his first classic horse in two years. And he comes in with a horse that's so, okay, a maiden winner and nothing more in terms of wins, but uh, comes in with blinkers on off of a fourth place finish and a close fourth place finish in the Santa Anita Derby when he was still being looked after temporarily by Tim Yachtin. Johnny Velasquez keeps the ride. He is four to one on the morning line. Johnny, let's start with you. Well, you know, when I first look at National Treasure, um, I think he might like shorter distances for his career uh, in this particular race. I'm not so sure as long as he, the pace looks like it's going to be uh, pretty s slow and he's probably going to be setting it. Um, you mentioned he returns to Baffert. Uh, he's coming out of one. I don't see any issue with that whatsoever in a race like this with only eight horses and the blinkers are on, as you mentioned also, which is means I think he's going to shoot out to the front and uh, it's catch me if you can. Um, workouts have looked really good at Santa Anita lately. I believe that Baffert thought that this may have been his best horse going back, you know, to last year. It just didn't work out that way so far. But um, I actually think this is probably the horse to beat in this race. Um, he's going out and, you know, may have a couple length lead early and dictate his own pace and uh and for, at Baffert bring him into this race right now he's probably as right as he could be so um I think he's going to be dangerous all right just a come and get him circumstance Johnny says with national treasure <laughs> Ed what do you think uh you pretty much agree with all that uh just nervous about the price because I think him and he and first mission the logical alternatives and then blazing sevens, maybe the, the next step down in terms of who people will bet Johnny V up from the rail. Why not go? Uh, I guess with blinkers, depending on what coffee with Chris does, you don't necessarily need a, a clear lead uh, but with the rail. I just can't imagine they're going to acquiesce position to coffee with Chris. So we know what Johnny can do on the front end, especially when he pairs with Baffert in these classics. Uh, I'm happy to say, uh, not quite what Johnny pulled off with Mage, but National Treasure was a part of the field 
in the Preakness Future Wager. And I got down pretty good on that. And it includes a couple others in this race at 13 to one. Uh, so I'm very pleased with that position and thinking that he might take a little too much money in the wind pool for my taste. Uh, I might just stand pat with that wager, but uh, I'm thrilled to have national treasure at that price. That's for sure. He's super dangerous on the front end under Johnny B. I mentioned four to one morning line. He's also four to one as of Wednesday morning in the, uh, I would say futures market as much as I would say fixed odds betting at Caesars in Las Vegas and at Circa in Las Vegas. So four to one is the lockstep right now. Mark, what about you? Yeah, I think Johnny and, and Ed kind of spelled it out well. This horse is very dangerous. Uh, he could get to the front or uh, he could be, uh, you know, on the lead with coffee with Chris, maybe first mission and and they're just not going fast. And if you look at this horse, uh, you know, like Johnny said, he really hasn't put it all together, but he kind of doesn't pass horses and horses don't pass him. So mm. he, you know, if he starts out fourth, he finishes third, starts out, uh, you know, second, he finishes second sort, sort of thing. So I think he's going to hang around a long time and, and could be very tough here. Um, and price wise may be a better play uh, than mage, but uh, I'll probably look at my play is probably a little bit more for the trifecta superfecta, but uh, this would be a player on top. He could definitely win. I agree. I must include, and I could end up keying him. Uh, the Blinker situation is interesting. As of today, uh, Wednesday, when we recorded, uh, Jimmy Barnes, who's here for Bob Baffert, uh, has not put blinkers on him yet, not in any of the gallops. So that, uh, and again, I mean, he's not working in company. So, all right, you could look at it that way. But for whatever it's worth, he hasn't put the blinkers on uh, just yet. One other interesting stat, this comes uh, from Brisnet. Uh, Baffert's record for putting blinkers back on a horse in his last 25 starts in such a circumstance uh eight percent so what would that be uh two two for 25 is that right do i have the math right ed so uh, three, yeah eight for that's, two for 25. Uh, that gives me pause but baffert's won this race seven times if he wins one more time he will break his tie with Wyndham walden a 19th century trainer for most preakness wins and that's national treasure then the number one horse. Let's go to the number two horse, and we're looking at a uh, maybe the longest shot on the board. Chase the Chaos, Ed Moger coming in with him. Uh, last win was in the El Camino Real Derby on the artificial at Golden Gate Fields. That was a win and you're in for the Preakness, but since uh, once on dirt, finishing seventh of nine in the San Felipe uh, grade two derby prep at Santa Anita, and then coming back in the California Derby on April 29th, and he finished eighth of nine uh, hopped at the start, no response, say the trip notes. So uh, Sheldon Russell will get the ride 50 to one on the morning line, longer than that in Las Vegas, 60 to one at Caesars, 65 to one at Circa. Ed? Yeah, my, my fair odds are more than 100. So uh, even at the in, inflated prices in the 702 area code, uh, still couldn't touch this one. It's not a lot to like on dirt. Uh, not sure how much time we want to spend on it, but, you know, made his debut on dirt at Canterbury, which is interesting that Canterbury has had two triple crown starters now this year. Uh, so right. good on them with two fills also having run mm -hmm. in Minnesota, but uh, went to turf to break his maiden. Synthetic is where he had his biggest success with the stakes win. Uh, the, the San Felipe just was not good. Uh, it, it's really tough to make any case that this horse has, a legitimate chance to win unless there's complete chaos, which he's chasing. I love the owners are here. They got the free birth with the El Camino. I get it, uh, especially with just seven others. Maybe they can lope around and get a check for fifth, uh, but he's not even, uh, I try not to use all uh, anyway, but I mean, this is a clear case of a, of a race where any money on Chase the Chaos is wasted. Mark? Yeah, I, I applaud the on owners for taking a shot. That's what horse racing is about, right? And we're not always, the experts aren't always right. But I, I agree, this horse uh, doesn't really have a shot in here, uh, pro probably because he doesn't handle the dirt well. And just to, in case you are thinking about, okay, well, Rich Strike, you know, came in at 80 to 1. This horse could run third, fourth, fifth, whatever. Um, I would just give you some sire stats that Astern, an Australian sire here, uh, he is going on a dirt route, only siring 7.5% winners. 
and uh, our HRN uh, proprietary impact stat is a minus 57%. So that's like a minus 57% ROI. Um, you know, give an example of the synthetic route, he's winning at 11%. So that's what he's going from to a play to a surface where his sire wins at seven and a half percent. And then at distances of greater than nine furlongs, his sire is 0 for eight. Um, wow. So I, th I think that sort of spells out the fact what we can see in the PPs is that he hasn't run well on dirt and he's probably not going to going a longer distance. What's the old line? You're saying there's a chance. Mark, you're saying there's not a chance from everything you seem to be giving us right here. There's always a chance. It's horse racing. We know that. All right. Johnny, um, is there a chance? <laughs> well, uh, you know, for the listeners out there, yeah, and you mentioned it early, is why is this horse even in this race? And it goes back to 2018 when Golden Gate uh, granted not 10 points to the winner, of the El Camino, but then, you know, free expenses pay trip to the Preakness. Um, and that's the only reason that this horse is here. Uh, you know, when you look at his races earlier in his career, when he was running first, second, third, uh, you know, they certainly were all on synthetic, as was mentioned. But then uh, he, you know, wins the El Camino and then comes back in a San Felipe, awful race. Uh, that was on dirt, then comes back in the Cal Derby, back to that same surface, and that race was awful. This horse is just way too slow. Even on his best day, he's way too slow. So I don't see this horse anywhere in the mix. Uh, it's going to be, um, I think, a good prop to put up is, will this horse finish last against, and we'll mention that another horse as we get to him. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's a sour here. subject for me, Johnny. I bet Jace's road to finish last in the Derby, and uh, he was 17th by a nose in front of Cyclone Mischief. So just missed, just missed it. Wow. Couldn't get the winner right. Couldn't get the loser right. <laughs> what was the price on it? Uh, it was a it was a Calcutta, and it ended up being 12 to one. Not bad. Yeah, it was it was it would have been a bailout score. Yeah. Not not a bad way to bail out at that point. Um, you might say, hey, Rombauer won coming out of the El Camino Real Derby. Th this ain't Rombauer. Okay, that was two years ago. <laughs> this ain't no. Rombauer. No, All right, not. so are we going from the outhouse to the penthouse here? If I'm going to put it bluntly, we go to the derby winner, and that is Mage, 8-5 to five on the morning line. And as mentioned, 7-5 to five in Vegas, probably on the way to 6-5 to five or shorter. Gustavo Delgado, who was here in the grandstand, this empty grandstand, a few minutes ago, getting his picture taken. Uh, he's the trainer. His son, of course, the assistant trainer, part owner. Also, uh, Ramiro Restrepo and uh, the, the group that uh, Ramiro put together after he found this horse at a phasic Tipton sale in 2022 for $290,000. And so from last year, the sale to this year, the Kentucky Derby winner uh, has never been shorter then nine to two going into a race has never been the favorite, but now here he is. He is the horse to beat coming in here at eight to five on the line. Javier Castellano will keep the ride and what a brilliant ride he gave this horse to get his first Derby victory. Mark, what do you want to say here about mage? I mean, I'm not sure what else to say that people can't already see. Uh, I think the horse, uh, you know, ran a huge race in the Derby uh, Derby horses have done traditionally very well in the Preakness and, uh, you know, he's, he's lightly raced, so he does have a chance to improve. I think the, the most important thing I would say from a betting standpoint is, you know, again, it is horse racing, things happen, bad trips happen, slow paces happen, bad breaks happen. So you don't want to get too into this horse at, you know, six to five kind of thing. Um, you know, if you really love them, then, you know, maybe bet something a little less or bet the exotics as i said i'm going to focus on uh probably trifectas and superfectas and the, this horse will definitely be one of the top choices I'm, I'm not going to be stubborn and throw them out of the top uh for, of the win spot for a trifecta or superfecta but i'm going to probably be hoping um betting wise to get a bigger price um you know i catch some good money on the horse in the derby so i'm a fan and i'd love to see him win and go to the triple crown i did get a nice triple crown bet after uh, the Derby, ten to one to win the Triple Crown, and I'm pretty excited about that one right Ooh, now. That, that wouldn't wouldn't be bad at all. Uh, I should note, Mage is from Good Magic. That's where the root word is in terms of honoring his sire. 
but technically it's a French word, and in French it's pronounced mage. And I say that because I have a hunch that Johnny Avello prefers the European, right, Johnny? I do. I rather call him Maj, but uh, I'll stick with Mage because that's his real name for this broadcast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if we're, if we're all wrong the same way, then we got to be right, right? <laughs> yes. You know, when, when you look at the lifetime on his horse and you see four races and a horse has won $2 million is outstanding. I mean, you just don't see that with many horses. Uh, and he is getting better. When you look at, at those four races, he's, uh, you know, first two were were kind of equal. And then he jumps up in the Florida Derby. And then, of course, jumps up another step to win the uh, Kentucky Derby, which means he's continuing continuously improving. Um, you know, when back to the Derby race, you talked about trips. Uh, Angel of Empire ran a very similar race to what Maj run, right? Same mage run, same same race. Uh, and when that horse was ready to go, uh, he looked to his right, and there was Maze right there. So he had to wait for Maze to clear. Then he went outside, and of course, another 10 yards in the race, he blows by them all. So it's about getting a good trip. Now, in this particular race, Maze doesn't have to worry about a lot of horses because the worst he could be in this race is eighth. And that's probably where he's going to be, seventh or eighth. Um, but this is not the type of race to uh, to come for, I mean, not that it can happen, but you want to be a little bit closer to the pace. I'm not sure this horse can do that. We're going back to his maiden special weight where he was like fourth and then took over the lead early. Can he run that type of race again? Will he run that type of race again? Um, the price is just is just way short. I I agree with the uh, you know that this horse should be probably in the mix. You're definitely not throwing him out, but uh, I'm looking for another win candidate here. All right. And what do you think? And, and and maybe even get into the pace dynamic a little bit here. Is there enough pace in this race for Mage to hunt down? Well, let me just say I am throwing him out, uh, not out of any disdain, but I just think the only way to make money in this race is to, unless you absolutely love him and he's your Stone Cold single, uh, I think you gamble a little bit. And my reasoning for that. And I understand why Mark or, or Johnny wouldn't subscribe to this. But two weeks ago, I was saying, well, this is a big ask. Fourth career start in three months. He really moved forward in the Florida Derby. And at 15 to one, I didn't like him enough, even, even when he made sense. And he certainly made sense after the race. So now two weeks later, we're looking at six to five. And my concern is still the same. Now it's the fifth career start in less than four months and if i thought it was an issue two weeks ago i'm willing to stick with it now that he's going to be an even shorter price and that's the type of scenario where they could just run out and maybe he's so good he's still second or third or first and i'm just going to have to lose but i just think he's going to be so over bet i'm going to gamble a little bit against him the pace is really interesting to me because the Fountain of Youth, we were told that, well, why wasn't he a little closer? Castellano blew it. He should have taken the race to Forte earlier. The Florida Derby was way back after that start. And then Mark talked about some of the not, you know, kind of being surprised about no gate drills or lack of uh, a volume of gate drills in the Derby. And it just seems like each of these starts were expecting to see some speed. And he won his debut around one turn going gate to wire, not an easy task. I wouldn't be shocked to see Javier be a little more aggressive and forwardly placed, especially knowing that National Treasure might try to steal it or that first mission could get jumped, the jump on Mage and be tough to reel in late. So I agree with you, Ron. That's a really interesting part of the dynamic, but I'm going to go with my read that eventually things are going to catch up to this horse. And I think there's more value in doing that here. Everyone's going to know come Belmont time that he's vulnerable at odds on if he's going for the triple crown. Uh, the wind pool might be enticing then, but the, the exotics won't. So this is where I'm going to gamble a little bit and try to beat him out of the number. Any thoughts about what you guys uh, said here? I want to circle the room here since we are talking about a potential triple crown candidate well, if he wins twice. I, I just wanted to add, I mean, I agree with what you're saying, Ed, and, and depending on how you bet it, it it's not the best bet. But I, I do think the evidence on Mage is that he's special. And and 
I want you know I get what I was trying to make the point is it's horse racing and as Johnny said he doesn't have to win the pace might not be good he might not ba- break great but uh, that's kind of why I ended up staying with Major in the Derby is not many horses zip to the lead and and win their debut then break poorly in a grade two and sort of almost win and break poorly in a grade one and legitimately almost win. So I think he's done special things. So I don't think we should be surprised if he continues to do special things um, is kind of where I'm at on this horse. And I was going to say, Ron, you know, you've seen him a lot on the backside. We saw him the day after the Derby, we were back there. Not that Derby horses aren't uh, feeling good or, or, or anything, but it seems a very, very good, horse very intelligent seems like he's feeling very good he's a very very good horse around that on the backside would you say yeah i i, I totally agree and it was uh, the, uh there was lip service paid to that by ramiro restrepo uh, in a story i did earlier this week for horse racing nation and uh, just watching him getting bathed i mean he knows he knows what the he knows what order his feet are going to get sponged he'll lift it knowing what's next uh, so he's i mean he's a pretty sharp horse in that regard uh, I, I don't. I want to go one one more step on this though. Mark, you identified in the, as a if you anybody was creating a little bit of buzz about him before the Florida Derby, it was you, Johnny. I, you know, you could sit there and say it was value only, but still, you could have gone value only on a lot of horses, and you still identified him. So, you guys saw something, right? Well, of course, we saw something. You know, he he looked like a horse that was improving, and uh, and. Obviously, when you look at the Florida Derby, you figured he, he that he could be in the second or third spot just behind Forte. That's what I saw and, and getting enough points yeah. to, to get in the race. Now, one thing I will point out about this horse coming to the Preakness is that if he gets beat by Angel of Empire in the Derby, which he very well could have, he probably doesn't run in this race and they save him for the Belmont. But he came out of this race clean. And so they're, you know, they, you're almost obligated. Now, Rich Strike wasn't because Rich Strike was terrible, in my opinion. I said he would never win another race, and he hasn't so far. Uh, but this horse is going to be a good horse down the road also, and maybe they would have saved him for the Belmont only. But there is a little pressure to bring him back in the Preakness. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had one derby horse in the race at all. Right. Well, Angel Empire, how about if they run second, third, maybe neither come. Uh, maybe no one comes from the Derby. I don't know, but um, I think uh, they would have liked to have had a little more rest. For him. And I, I actually uh, pulled some stats uh, on Delgado, and I, I don't know this for sure, but just looking at the numbers, I'd be shocked in the last generation. He might actually have the most experience of any trainer I can remember coming into the Preakness with a Derby winner on two weeks rest. Uh, he's 12 for 76 over the last nine years. Uh, and nine for fourteen with favorites. Nine for wow. fourteen on two on two weeks. On two Ed? weeks rest. Wow, wow. That's exactly fourteen days. I also queried eight to twenty days, so a little more than a week, a little less than three to get that full range. And he's seventy nine for four seventy five, which is decent. Uh, yeah. But thirty two for eighty eight with favorites. Uh, wow. So, He's uh he's a trainer that that's not afraid to wheel him back. Now, granted, a lot of these are claiming races at Gulfstream or Gulfstream Park West when it was open. But nevertheless, uh, usually when we run these stats going into the Preakness, we're looking at 12, 20 starts maybe over the last 10 years. Gustavo's done it a bunch and he's won with it. Mark, it's EJ's Nito stat of the night. I, I'm telling you, that, that's, that's fantastic. So, so he could be an overlay at six to five, according to those stats. <laughs> yeah, according to well, especially with the favorite, like you know, I balance it because, as you all said, you're sort of obligated if, you, if the horse comes out like it's the triple crown. And I appreciate the respect for it that they wanted to do this if the horse said they could, but. Those are some those are some pretty good stats with sort oh. of an esoteric. Uh, those are great. Frame. Those are great stats. It's a great find. I mean, I would add too to you know if you watch the replay, um, Castellano just sort of you know granted he's in the back on a faster pace and that's the place to be. We saw that with with Rich Strike, but this horse like pretty much on his own kind of came all the way up to the field, circled the field to get to about fifth, and really was straightening for home before Castellano even asked him at all. Uh, you know, it it was it was very impressive for sure, and and 
you know, I'm not sure. I don't know that I would agree necessarily that uh, the other horses that Angel Vampire would get by him necessarily. Um, I do think those top three really separated themselves from from the rest. And um, but you know, again, it's horse racing that he's going to probably need some sort of semblance of a trip. Obviously, if they let National Treasure walk it, which I don't think is going to happen, but uh, you know, that's going to make any horse, you know, like early voting we saw on a loose lead, it's going to be tough to run down. I, I you know, Mark, uh, you watch this horse in training too, Mage. He accelerates as he seems to pass each post. You know, he'll he'll uh, go boom a little faster, a little faster, just in gallops. So there's he has a sense about him. He has a sense about him knowing where he is on the track and what his job is. And he's the most chill horse in the morning. And Javier Castellano is a pretty chill guy nowadays, too. This is a you know, I mean, now I'm, I'm kind of talking myself back onto the horse here, even though we're yeah. looking at even money by the time we get done with all this. Right? One other thing, no, too. And two, two guys I know that play a lot. One does a lot of fixed betting. They think he'll be odds on. Yeah, I don't disagree. And one other thing, too, that we talked about reasons to be on him before is the Florida Derby. He actually made a couple moves in that race. So he broke slow. He makes that big move around the turn. Then he kind of settled for a little bit. Then he made another big move to the lead uh, before he got past at the very end. Like, that, that's not a normal thing. That's not a normal thing for a horse in its third start to do. So I, I do think the body of evidence, if you really sit back, is that this horse is special now. Again, it doesn't mean he needs to win at the Preakness, but uh, I think he's done some special things for a young horse. Johnny, let me give you the final word on, you can call him Maj or you can call him Mage. Uh, I mean, we've said everything about him. We don't know where he's going to end up in his career, but he, you know, I expect to see him in the summer campaign, probably at the, probably at the Travers Stakes. Um, maybe he'll pass and, and you know, maybe right, run at Mammoth uh, in Haskell. I don't know what the plans are for him, but uh, he's certainly done everything they've asked of him so far. Let me break here. We'll do the last five on the other side of what we're going to do right now. Uh, among other things, I do want to tell you the past performances heard on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod are provided by Brisnet, the only place where you can find Kieran's speed points the easy way to map the pace in any race. Find out more at brisnet.com. The final five for the Preakness coming up. Ron Flatter with Johnny Avello, Ed DeRosa, and Mark Midland. Before we get to the remaining five horses in the Preakness, let me ask Johnny to go ahead and talk about a little something he's involved with called DK Horse. Yeah, we launched DK Horse now. You know, when you look at DraftKings, you look at a, a fantasy company, a sports company, a casino company. Actually, we have a, an online casino, which does very well. Uh, and we knew we needed another vertical, which was horse racing. And that's one of the reasons, uh, you know, one of the things that they wanted me to bring to the company when I came on board. And I've been working with a team, a great team to, uh, to launch this DK horse. And it is now launched uh, about six weeks ago. It's doing fabulous, continues to grow. Um, it is not part of the normal app. If you went to the DraftKings app to find the sports and fantasy, it would not be there. It's a standalone app. Uh, we'll, we will integrate it at some point. But so far, it's just doing fabulous. So um, we have some specials out there, a deposit match of 250 um, We started as DK usually does some other type of offerings where if your horse runs second or third, you get a 10 free $10 uh, wager. Uh, we're going to offer that for uh, Friday and Saturday at the, at the Pimlico. So um, we're real happy where, where we are right now. We are a little behind everybody in the game, but we're catching up fast. So uh, the platform's great. You get to watch the races, you get to watch replays, you get specials and you get to bet a lot of content. I mean, there's more content on this app than I've ever offered in my entire racing career. Wow. That's saying something. So if there's you're looking, lot. if you're looking for this, go to the app store. If it's the, if it's uh, Google play, or if you're using Android, wherever you find apps there, Apple, of course, you know, that Apple started apps. So go there and look for DK horse and uh, download that onto your phone, onto your tablet, whatever you're using and start to enjoy what Johnny has on offer now. It's uh, really exciting to see DraftKings get into the horse racing game. That's that's really good for the game. 
Let's turn to something that's going to go on Friday. And I might make the case that this is going to be a better race than the Preakness. The Black Eyed Susan, it is a mile and an eighth. It is, of course, for three-year-old fillies. Twelve of them showed up. Oh, and did one really show up? And that is the number nine horse for Bob Baffert, the Gervin filly, Faza. Flavie and Pratt will ride. All she is is five for five, most recently winning by a runaway six and a half in the Santa Anita Oaks back on April 8th. So in this field of 12, let's go ahead and get a snapshot. Are you going to be for or against FaZa as they will be racing in the Black Eyed Susan on Friday? Johnny, let me start with you. Yeah, this is a, this is a special horse. Um, you know, the question I would have asked is, why didn't they run this horse into Kentucky Oaks? because he certainly would have had a legitimate shot at winning. That. Well, I can, I can actually answer that. Michael Lund Peterson, the owner, is so loyal to Bob Baffert, he was transferring none of his horses to any other trainer. He said it was Baffert or Buss, and that was why. Okay, thank you. Um, I just uh, I think this horse is the certainly the class of the race. I don't see anybody beating this horse in this race. Um, and there's one race that this horse has had that I believe will help the horse at Pimlico, and that's going to be the starlet at Los, uh, Los Alamitos race course. We know that that, that race course has got very tight turns. This horse has, ran, has run there, has won there, now brings, uh, you know, her talent to Pimlico, and I'll just keep it short, guys. This horse is tremendous. I, I don't, just don't see anyone in this field beating her. Now, yeah, you know, what will I use behind? I, I don't know. I know Miracle's probably a horse that I will use in the mix, but don't know where I'm going from there because everybody else looks outclassed. Mark? Uh, I think this is a great bet against opportunity. Um, I mean, she's undefeated. That's great. Uh, she's seven to five on the morning line. She could be six to five, even money or even less uh, at the windows. I think this is a deeper field than it looks like. It is 12 horses. There's going to be a lot of, of field to get through and traffic. Um, you know, and tell me no lies is the horse that she beat the last two times in California. Uh, I don't know if this is fair, but and tell me no lies finished 12th in the Oaks. Um, I think the, the West Coast form on the dirt shipping across country is a little bit questionable at times. Uh, so I really I do question what she beat. And I mean, I, I hear the thing about loyalty, but, you know, I think if Baffert thought this horse could win the Oaks, I, I don't think he would begrudge his owner or or would even potentially tell his owner to ship, potentially give it to another trainer. Um, I, you know, to me, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of reasons for her, but but the big one to bet against her is it's the price. So I think you got to come out swinging against her and you can hit uh, an I was going to say an Oaks Derby double, a Black Hat Season Preakness double. Uh, all the, the races on Friday end in this uh, sequence. And I should mention uh, Pimlico Preakness, uh, 12 pick fives on Friday. And yeah. Saturday. So they went all in. The way to remember it is uh, there's two two days, uh, two two day pick fives. One's all stakes, one is all dirt. And then the five pick fives each day start on the odds. So race one, three, five, seven, and nine. And uh, so I think that's pretty cool. They're all 12% takeout. So 12 pick fives at 12% takeout. Easy to remember. Um, a friend of mine said, I think you get, you get you should get a t-shirt if you bet all 12 pick fives. You should get a reward. Do you have a lean on the Oaks though? Did you give us a lean? On on the Black Eyed Susan? About Black Eyed Susan, pardon me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like Taxed, uh, the 10 horse okay. that's been chasing West, wet paint. And then I think my top choice is going to be Merlaza for Brad Cox. Uh, last race at Oaklawn, it was one of those where uh, she was three to five and she sat behind a very slow pace. And it's one of those like, are you going to move? Are you going to move? Are you going to move? And when Rosario moved, she just inhaled that field. I want to watch that replay again, but I think she's dangerous and you're going to get a real nice price. Uh, six to one on morning line, but the, the speed figures are lower because of the slow pace. So you might even get more than that. I agree with you on, on Merlaza, especially since she's got comparative a stable mate in there who might help her out on the pace. Ed, what about you? Well, I'm, uh, I guess, in the middle. Uh, I respect Faze a lot and more interested in betting her in this 12-horse field than I am Mage at odds on uh, against the others in the Preakness. So 
that double, uh, you know, even with FISA here, um, you know, maybe into a horse like National Treasure or First Mission could be okay if you're willing to beat Mage. Uh, but my wagering strategy for the race uh, is definitely going to go through Balpool, number eight, who no one's mentioned, which uh, gives me some hope that we might get eight to one. Uh, the, the figures are there. I am a little concerned about the mile and eighth distance, but at this price, uh, and given that there is plenty of pace in front of her, uh, she has one gate to wire, but just looking at the Brisnet pace ratings and the time form U.S. pace projector, uh, she's going to be behind some horses, and it looks like it could be pretty spirited up front. I uh, figure Pratt will want to sit off as well, and if Balpool can follow uh, uh, Faza, uh, maybe they're 1-2 one, two, or 2-1 two, or, or whatever. So basically those two are kind of my keys uh, in what should be a pretty good vertical opportunity with the 12 horses. And the last thing I'll mention against FaZa is she is carrying 124. Uh, there are some allowance conditions to yeah. the stakes. And Balpool gets in at 118, as do a few others. Uh, and six pounds is is not inconsequential. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer in weight, especially when you start getting to spreads bigger than a few pounds. Uh, so that, that, to me, was kind of the final oomph to maybe take a shot at a price. So I'll put the eight on top, uh, but basically I, I'm playing the race that at eight, nine are going to be in there together. The black eyed Susan will be the 13th race on Friday at five 44 Eastern time. Let's continue with the last five horses. We have not touched on from the Preakness. We went through the first three. So let's pick it up now with another horse. that's going to be a long shot. And until we heard that we're going to see blinkers on national treasure, it looked like coffee with Chris was going to have his way with the pace is the only speed in the race. So the only question of course, would be how long would he last? You have John Salzman jr. Training for his dad. Who's uh, one of the owners. And uh, you have Jaime Rodriguez who's in the irons as he has been most recently finishing fifth in the Federico Tessio, the traditional prep for this race uh, before that was second in the private terms. Last win was in a $100,000 uh, race at Laurel back on February 18th. It covered a mile 20 to one at the end of all of that. And so let's go ahead and start with you, Ed. What do you think about coffee with Chris? Yeah. Uh, would have maybe been intrigued to hang on for a slice if, if on loan speed, but it, it just seems like national treasure. is going to make that impossible. Uh, and then looking at the breeding, to be able to see this out with some pressure from legitimate graded stakes horses seems a bridge too far. So uh, coffee with Chris is in the chase, the chaos bin for me. Uh, appreciate that they're here. Always love seeing the local connections uh, get a shot at the Preakness, but this just seems like a, a really tall task to even crash the exotics. Uh, I will note though uh, that the breeder is none other than NTRA uh, president Tom Rooney. Mm -hmm. uh, who sold this one for $2,000 uh, at uh, one of the local sales and uh, coffee with Chris has earned uh, two and a quarter. So good on the connections uh, for spot in the bargain as they did with extra heat way back when and, and many others through the years, but uh, love that they're here. Hope they enjoy the alibi breakfast, but I would be utterly shocked uh, if this horse won on Saturday. Johnny, what do you think of coffee with Chris? Not a whole lot. Um, you know, the, the numbers just don't look good here. Uh, you know, if you go back and look at the race at Pimlico last year, uh, one one that raced through disqualification uh, with a 27 buyer. Uh, and you mentioned how you could have 2000 for this horse, but you could have bought it for 40 uh, back in October of uh, 22. So, um you know, this horse is just is too slow. Now, you know, when you look at that Federico Tessio, uh, you got beat by performing that race, uh, was fading the whole time at shorter distance. Um, now, this is a horse I would I mentioned that I would put up against Chase the Chaos. This is a great matchup between these two. Uh, probably mm -hmm. make coffee with Chris about a dollar forty or so. Uh, and then, you know, the theory is how you're going to bet the race is. Will Coffee with Chris fade and go all the way back? And will Chase the Chaos just hang around and pick up the pieces and maybe beat Coffee with Chris, you know, at the end of the race? So 
that'd be the way to handicap it. Those two against one another, but not can't be used anywhere else. Mark, he's one for one at Pimlico. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I would be interested in that uh, that prop bet with Chase the Chaos. Um, I do think this horse is improving a little bit, and I was kind of you know sniff around to say, okay, is this a long shot that could hold on for fourth or or something? Um, it does. It does seem like it's a little bit against it. Uh, a one really good stat from the super screener, uh, a long shot speed horse like Coffee with Chris hasn't finished in the Superfecta in at least 15 years. Ooh. Um, now, most of the Preakness's aren't, you know, don't have this little, little speed, right? Um, if, you know, Johnny V sits on National Treasure, you know, and they let this horse go, you know, this horse might go off at 50 to 1. Uh, and they might say, well, you know what, that's fine. Just sit behind him and let's go as slow as we can go. And at a certain point, the horse, you know, won't stop at least to to, to finish fourth or something like that. Um, I do think that the one, one thing I've, I've been looking at is the Tessio. I think people are going to throw uh, that race out. And uh, it was an interesting race that uh, this horse fought with another horse all the way. And, uh, and at the end, it sort of collapsed and perform came flying. Um, I'm actually thinking that the long shot's going to come from those two. Wow. And I'm kind of go with perform over coffee with Chris. Okay. But my caveat will be if Johnny V lets this horse go and he just sits and it's like a 50 type pace. I don't think we should expect this horse to run, you know, last. I think he, he should probably run third or fourth if he's okay. on a, lone lead at 50 you know I, I don't think he will be because first mission's got some speed as well uh again those stats about long shots and the, the preakness that they've not done well as speed horses they've done well as closers so um i'm, I'm just gonna hope i'm not wrong but I'm, I'm gonna pitch this horse completely although i would i would bet i would be pretty bullish on him beating chase the chaos in a head-to-head okay so, interesting you know, prop and uh, do that then <laughs> yeah, you What's guys can have your have a side I bet. I think Chase the Chaos will finish ahead of him. I smell okay. a side bet. You can do a side I'll bet. I'll take the that. juice, guys. I'll I'll just take <laughs> the juice. <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> state lines in Kentucky doesn't do that yet. Well, anyway, All right. um, we'll go hundred and hundred. And what 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 do you want for the juice? You can hold the money. <laughs> I'll, I'll just I'll take nine percent. Nine percent. We might have to bet a bet a dinner. <laughs> Yeah, but the tip, that would be the tip. Uh, <laughs> Coffee with Chris, 35 to 1, best price right now in Vegas, circa 24 at Caesars, if uh, you want to go that direction with this, uh, as mentioned, $2,000 uh, Colt by Ride On Curling. Uh, let's get to Red Route 1. He's the number five horse for Steve Asmussen, who decided not to bring Disarm from the Derby and a fourth place finish there to the Preakness. They'll look ahead to the summer for him. Uh, here's another gun runner, you know, Steve and those gun runners and anybody in those gun runners, frankly, coming off of a head win in the bathhouse row, which is a, uh, a traditional prep uh, for this race now out of Oaklawn. That was back on April 22nd. Joel Rosario will keep the ride. And uh, so he goes off at 10 to one on the morning line. He is as long as 18 to one at Circa in Las Vegas, 12 to one. Uh, at Caesars. Uh, Ed, let's start with you with Red Route 1, a closer, stone cold closer. Yeah, I'm nervous about how much he'll have to do, and, and the speed numbers don't really stack up against the others on the win end. Uh, we'll get to perform in a moment. To me, maybe taking a stand on which one of those ends up in the try uh, to upset you know, two of the other contenders, so to speak. Uh, is is the way I'm thinking of, of playing this. Uh, and I, I do prefer the other one just because I think Red Route 1, as the morning line indicates, will be a shorter price, uh, especially with, you know, Asmussen and kind of a no name on the Triple Crown Trail. But just think this one has has a lot to do. And as a, as a pattern reader with Ragazin, not to give away their store, but this horse is consistent. He runs a lot of 12s uh, and that's all he runs. He hasn't improved. He hasn't regressed, but it, it just seems like it would be a shock given his running style that we're going to see some breakthrough performance uh, that can win this race. And, and 10 to 1 to me is really light relative to his speed numbers in the field. So knowing that he's going to take some money as a horse that, oh, he's the closer, he can get third. 
uh, I, I'm going to try to beat him out of the number uh, as well and, and put prefer perform who we'll get to in a moment, but this is a big underlay in my mind in all the spots. Mark. Yeah, I think I'd said it really well. That's it's about exactly where I'm on this horse. Uh, I think uh, the long shot closer, if you will, um, I'm going to lean towards perform and I'm hoping his morning line of 15 may actually be 18 to one. This horse is 10 to one on the morning line. He may actually be nine or eight. And uh, I think uh, if Perform doesn't get there, I think Red Route 1 would be the one to finish ahead of him. So uh, I'm glad to hear what Ed's saying is that his number has not improved. It's, you know, he just kind of like, he's, people are going to see that he finished second into Arabian Night in the Southwest, second to Confidence Game in the Rebel. Uh, he's behind an Angel of Empire in the Arkansas Derby, but he didn't even split the field. He was six out of 10 that day. So uh, he just seems like uh, it's he's a little lackluster. If the pace isn't fast, I think he's a horse that you want to probably play against. Johnny? It's true that his number hasn't improved, but he hasn't regressed. Uh, so, he, you know, he is sitting on a better race. I wouldn't say a big race. He's sitting on a better race. He's probably the fourth or fifth best horse in the race, depending on how the race shakes out. The distance is no problem. I think if, you know, if I was the, trainer of the horse i'd say okay you you just follow uh maj that's all just follow mage just just follow him whatever he does and you might get a piece of the race but um you know I, I, he looks like he'll he'll be okay in the race he'll be coming late and he'll probably finish somewhere maybe fourth uh you know and that's probably i think the best you can expect red route one is a uh homebred by uh Winchell Thoroughbreds, Ron Winchell, as mentioned, gunrunner out of the Tappet Mare Red House. So we go from five to six. We mentioned a couple times, perform. This horse was supplemented for $150,000 into this race, thus making the purse now $1.65 million. By good magic, $230,000 Colt. Um, and you have Shook McGahee training. Fergal Lynch will keep the ride coming off of a head victory in the Federico Tessio down at Laurel last month so at 15 to 1 on the morning line we also see he's 14 to 1 at caesars 20 to 1 at circa mark let's start with you with perform yeah as i said i, I think i'm going to take a shot with this price and uh you know one of the ways uh, i think you can make a little money on this race and it's it's not uh uh super um uh, interesting uh, i would say is just i think that the, the top three favorites sort of have this field over over a barrel uh so with national treasure mage and first mission the 138 i think they're highly likely to round out the exacta and maybe even the trifecta so one of the ways you could bet that is let's say you just want to take a five dollar trifecta 138 over 138 and then just key the six and third and just say okay i this is a long shot closer that could run third and you can actually do the same thing in the Superfecta, and it's it's the same cost. It's thirty dollars for the to do the five dollar try with, uh, like that with six combinations, and then five dollars to key uh, perform in a five dollar Superfecta in fourth. So that would be my play: just key the one three eight in first, second, and then perform in third, and then one three eight first, second, third, and perform in fourth. The one caveat I would say is um, that's I'm assuming that performs a little higher than 15 to one around there and red route one is maybe a little lower than 10 to one. If they're both 15 to one, I would possibly play them both. Um, and I think that's a way where, you know, because the tickets are focused around a long shot, especially if you just pick one, uh, you can get a little bit of a, a little bit of payoff and then you could just kind of watch the top horses and see how they finish. Uh, as far as perform specifically, um, I think he's developed nicely for for Shug. Uh, I think some of the development is hidden. Uh, three races ago, uh, he faced Mage down at Gulfstream. Uh, if you look back, the first five races of his career, he's kind of uh, tracking the pace a little bit, um, really kind of going a little bit. Uh, they took uh, blink, tried blinkers, took blinkers off. Uh, two races back at Tampa, I think it was a pretty nice race in a small seven horse field at Tampa. He sat near the back on a slow pace, essentially circled the field on wide on both turns and drew off and beat a decent Pletcher that came back one at Churchill. And uh, and then he won a deep Tessio. And 
I would encourage people to watch that Tessio replay. He came flying in the end. That doesn't necessarily mean um, that uh, he's going to win here, but uh, I think he had a lot of trouble that day. He broke slow. Um, I think it's a little hard to read that Tessio, whether that pace was fast or slow. Uh, the pace was a 48 and change, so perhaps it was slow. Right. He, he did come back. I've seen other uh, speed figure makers say that that pace was faster. Um, but I do think this is an improving horse at the right time and good magics are doing well, as we know, at a route of ground. And if you can get, you know, 15 to one or higher, I think he's worth keen on. So, yeah, speaking of the route of ground, correct me if I'm wrong, perform 0 for 5 at one turn, 2 for 2 at two turns. Do I have that right? <laughs> it was saying, that way. Johnny, what do you think? Uh, Mark mentioned that race against... Uh against Mage back three races ago. Prior to that, he couldn't win a race. His numbers were terrible. Uh, you know, then he's improved his last two races. But I just think that that uh, Federico Tessio looks good on paper. I don't think that was really that good a race, to be honest. Not against this group. He's run against much weaker horses uh, than the top three or so, four in this, in this race. So... Um, if he's going to be used at all by me, it couldn't be anywhere better than the fourth spot. So, you know, I just don't see him as a as a player in the, you know, in the top three spots. Ed, what about you? That Tessio was uh, so interesting on the rail the whole time. I had to find a couple scenes. And even at the eighth pole, knowing he won, he just looks impossible from there. And... I agree with Johnny. It's somewhat a function of who was in there that he was able to to get his nose down and, and win the race over that group. That's not going to work against this crew, but uh, he does seem to like two turns, so that's a positive. Uh, not really looking to use him at all uh, in the win spot, but I do think is the, what is he, the sixth choice in this race. Uh, that starts to get a little interesting if you're willing to, to key underneath a little bit knowing that he's going to be five horses who are taking more money than him uh and i do think he has utility uh for that reason so uh he, he won't be on any horizontals um uh, not looking to close with him in anything but i do think uh he's he's a player underneath he's just gonna come with his run at around two turns which we've seen and at 15 to 1 i I think it's worth it. We haven't really talked about the, the prices overall. I mean, we think Mage might actually be odds on. I wouldn't be shocked if that's the case. Uh, I don't know if there's any residual long shot uh, betting going on. I think we saw it a little bit in the Derby. We certainly saw it last year in the Preakness. But if horses like Chase the Chaos and Coffee with Chris are just 20 or 30 to 1 in this group, that's still eight or nine points uh, that you're distributing to others. So. You know, maybe that'll help a little bit. I'd love to see them as is a big of an underlay, and if perform like Mark said is sixteen or eighteen to one, I think that's sort of your key underneath. All right, so that uh, takes us through perform, and I, I I'm not going to ignore perform near the top of the ticket. I may not key him, but I may have a ticket or two that includes him right at the top. I think he could he could steal this if there's uh, any kind of a pace involving national treasure, and even you know coffee with Chris for about you know quarter mile, whatever it may be. Uh, Blazing Sevens would be looking for a lot of pace out front. He's another okay. horse that likes to close. And here's Chad Brown, 2017, cloud computing, skip the Derby, win the Preakness. 2022, early voting, skip the Derby, win the Preakness. So he tries to do that again with this closer who was a distant third uh, in the bluegrass. His last win, uh, it was noteworthy. The only other grade one winner in this field other than Mage is Blazing Sevens, who won the Champagne last year, but has since finished fourth in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, was a very distant and troubled eighth in the Fountain of Youth, and then, as mentioned, hitting the board in the bluegrass. Irad Ortiz Jr., the champion rider, will be on board. He is 6-1 to one on the morning line. Ed, why don't we start with you? I'm, I mean, this is the, along with Mage, obviously, who certainly is a far more likely winner than Blazing Sevens. But this is this is a horse who does concern me because I really don't want to bet him at six to one and could even see him a little shorter than that, given the Irad. And we know what Chad's done 
skipping the derby and, and coming here with a, a fresh face, so to speak. I just, as a closer, his late pace ratings aren't even what performed his run. So I'm thinking, man, if, if he's fourth of the logical contenders, uh, National Treasure, First Mission, Mage, and then Blazing Seventh, the fourth of those four, it's really hard for me to see that he's able to pass the three horses ahead of him who are the other contenders. So I'm looking to, to fade him on top and it's the fourth choice. That's not that inspired, but I do think anyone who goes beyond mage uh, is going to say, well, I could use blazing seven since I'm not using mage. Mark said something really good earlier about super screener to me, especially this race with just eight, you really want to be tight and just whatever your opinion is, you know, you're gambling, you're not making bets on something that's a hundred percent, but where's the edge. And I think too many people are going to overuse blazing sevens uh, that aren't keying on mage. Cause they'll think, well, I can use a couple since I'm not on the favorite. So for me, I'm looking to beat them out of the top spot, but the numbers are too good. Chad's too good in this spot. And if I'm not going to use Mage on top anyway, then I'm still comfortable with Blazing Sevens and second or third, especially keyed with Perform. Uh, but as a win candidate, I just think he's a big underlay. Johnny? Yeah, you know, the the, the Chad Brown, uh, I read Ortiz connection scares me a little bit when you look and, you know, and it should. Uh, but Chad won this race. You mentioned two of the last five, but not, not with a horse that runs this type of style. Um, you know, his champagne race was brilliant, but that wasn't a slop. And you would think that after the maiden special weight and then the hopeful and then the champagne, from that point, he's going to escalate and he's going to be one of your top uh, three-year-olds. And it hasn't turned out that way because the fountain of youth wasn't good. The bluegrass was better. He kind of came back to that, uh, that champagne number. Um, but He's just not a horse that I see on the win side. I mean, I, I I think you have to use him in your in your trifectas and superfectas. I just don't see him as a as a win candidate here. He hasn't been any match for Forte uh, anytime he's run against him. National Treasury couldn't be couldn't be verifying couldn't be tap it twice. Uh, so yeah, I, I see him in the mix, but probably no higher than third. Mark, he added blinkers last time to get back to third after having finished off the board previous two races, having blinkers again. And by the way, in Las Vegas, uh, eight to one, you can get them at Circa. Otherwise, it's a six to one consensus. So, Mark, what do you think of Blazing Sevens? I mean, he's raced uh, three times, two turns, never hit the exact, uh, never been within five lengths of the win. Um as Johnny said, this isn't the type of chat horse that's come over here and done well in the Preakness. Um, here's the way I look at the race. It's an eight horse field. As we've kind of said, there's two long shots that don't have a shot. Now it's a six horse field. There's three top contenders, which I think most people agree on, assuming you like national treasure. And we basically said those three are going to comprise the exacto. There's a very good chance. So then you have three long shot or three closers to choose from. You've got roughly blazing sevens at five to one red route one at 10 to one and perform at 15 to one. In my mind, they're just about all even. So I would much rather take perform at 15 to one, get a lot more juice on your payoffs. And uh, as I said, if you keep performing third and fourth, you could throw this horse in third. I think that's probably logical. I, I do think that I read, you know, connections is a little scary there. Um, but I don't think this horse has done anything to show that uh, he's going to hit the exacta here or, or leapfrog those top two. I think he's an underlay at six to one. Um, so I, I, I don't like them, but you know, again, if performs 20 to one, then I, I get a chance to include this horse in third, just because the payoff's going to be either in grade ones, third in the hopeful. Well, I guess now second with the DQ of Forte, uh, first in the champagne was fourth in the breeders cup juvenile third in the bluegrass. So he'll be coming in with that, uh, bit of experience in grade one races, Finally, on the outside, number eight, first mission, a Godolphin homebred. Brad Cox is doing the training here. Street Sense is the sire. Luis Saez is the rider, and this is the least experienced racing-wise of any of the horses in the Preakness. He's only run 
three races, second in his debut, broke his maiden by six and three quarters at fairgrounds, and then won in a, uh, a beast of a performance in the Lexington when he got pinned on the rail and still found his way through at Keeneland. So uh, he's raced and uh, didn't race before February 18th. He is five to two on the morning line. Johnny? Boy, this horse, I mean, he, he looks like, uh, first of all, you can't, you have to have him in the top three for sure. I mean, he looks to me like the one horse, if I had to pick a horse, I would say would definitely be in the top three in this race. This is the horse I would pick. Uh, he should have a very clean break could, because Blazing Saddles isn't going out. Performs probably going out just to get position. Uh, this horse could go right out to the lead. This horse could make or break a uh, national treasure for sure. But uh, he just... He's just coming along very nicely. And to me, he's the danger in the race and not going to be surprised if he's the winner of the race. Uh, just don't like the price. It's a little short there. So mm -hmm. certainly keep an eye on that uh, on Saturday. But God, he's got everything going for him right now. Five to two, by the way, everywhere in Vegas, also on the morning line. Ed? Yeah, I, I struggle with him or National Treasure as sort of being the, the one to make a top pick. Uh, trying to beat Mage. I guess I'll go with National Treasure because it'll be the longer price. But first mission, I just love the fact that this horse doesn't stop. Uh, the late pace rating, he, just, he gets faster, but he's pressed the pace. Now he's going to get a, a stronger test here, I think, with National Treasure being the pace setter and then maybe Coffee with Chris uh, put on the gas as, as far as he's willing to go. But this is a polarizing horse because I've gotten two tests. From handicappers I respect that say this horse is a lot and get the best price you're ever going to get on him now. I know that's a little hy hyperbolic, but there's buzz to this horse. And if you're a believer, this is the opportunity, especially in the wind pool, because I do think Mage is going to be six to five. Some even think odds on. That's going to help the price on this one. Uh, but again, for me, the way I looked at my fair odds, there's just a lot of underlays here. Uh, the, the takeouts biting into this race too much. So first mission, I agree with Johnny. If I was alive in a show parlay, it would absolutely go on first mission in this group. Uh, but instead, uh, it's going to be more about getting perform in the try, and then first mission would be fine to be in there with him. Mark? Yeah, there's a lot to like about this horse, as, as Johnny and, and Ed, Ed said. Uh, he's done very little wrong. Uh, we should also note the Lexington uh, disarm came out of that race. Disarm was about uh, five links back and 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 ran very well in the Derby. Um, horse is working well, so we could see improvement. And uh, you know, I think Sai is probably um, is is really key to this race because he could sit off National Treasure in the speed. And I think it's like how slow can I go where I can go if if he, he's confident he can go by National Treasure. If Mage is far back, uh, you know, then it potentially helps helps the horses up front. Uh, and we'll again, as noted earlier, we'll see how far back Mage is. But he can sit outside. He can kind of dictate what he wants to do. Horses come in into the race great, and he's done very little wrong. So um, very very likely to win the race. And uh, I can't argue uh, taking him over Mage with a better price. And probably a little, he, he's a better bet I think than Mage just because of the price and uh, also. Uh, we know where he can sit. We know he's got more options, um, you know, with Major Castellano, if they break slow or they, they're they convinced they want to be further back, um, that might not work out as well on Saturday. I like this horse for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is if you look at his odds and where he was going into his races, he's two for two as a favorite. And the one time he was a joint favorite, basically, he finished a close second. So it, it was, we used to say in basketball, he's played to his seeding. And that's one thing. The expectations may be lofty for him, but they have been met by first mission. So he's a horse I'm going to like a lot. We will get the final thoughts from the panel here in a few moments. Mark, I want to at least get a, a final word from you, not even a final word, but maybe a good first step of a word for folks who may not have gone to picks.horseracingnation.com because you talk about a tool shed that is packed 
that's the place to go. Yeah, there's some amazing tools there and uh, some tools that can really help you play the races uh, in a little different way and find some horses that, uh, you, you know, you might get beat uh, ordinarily. Uh, the first time power rating report is is amazing the way uh, I think we've got a, a one through five star rating on every first timer uh, based on a proprietary algorithm, which rates things like workouts and training record and some other uh, things that go into the secret sauce. And um, it's just a really great help to be able to have that kind of information uh, going into looking at firsters, especially firsters in a horizontal sequence where uh, they may be in the third or fourth leg and, and you won't know how the betting's going to look. So the first time power rating report, uh, one of my favorites is the Sire Moves report. Uh, hit a nice, uh, I think it was 18 to one at uh, Indiana the other day on the turf. Uh, it was a horse that was moving. Uh, I think it might've been from the synthetic to the turf, but uh, the Sire Moves report will show you uh, how the, the sire's offspring do in different races. And uh, it highlights the moves, big, big positive, big negative moves. So you don't get burned on these horses that uh, go from synthetic and then they jump up on turf or jump up on dirt or vice versa, or, or maybe they're better in a turf sprint or something like that. All those moves are analyzed and highlighted for you. And uh, it's just a great, well, great tool. It's part of our HRM Pro Reports package, the Sire Moves Report. Excellent stuff. Uh, you owe it to yourself to check this out. It takes no effort at all. Just a rat a tat tat of the keyboard. Mm -hmm. Picks, P I C K S, picks.horseracingnation.com. The hardcore handicappers will be back in three weeks to preview the Belmont Stakes, but will we have a triple crown on the line or not? Let's get some final thoughts and final ideas about how the plays will be made for Saturday here at Pimlico for the race at 7.01 p.m. Eastern. From DK Horse from DraftKings, here's Johnny Avello. Well, first, I'd like to say uh, thanks for having me on, Ron. And, uh, you know, I what Mark just said, we have a lot of new players on DK Horse. And, you know, you, you don't have to fly alone. There's information out there for you that Mark just alluded to. So uh, use the, those handicapping tools to help you. Uh, and you'll find your way in this game. Uh, there's, you know, you, you'll find what works for you. And I must mention that Horse Racing Nation is a great site. I go there all the time. I love the site. I like the information. So great job, you guys. Um, as far as this race is concerned, I'm, uh, you know, I'm looking at National Treasure as my top horse probably going to use first mission maybe on top also those two in uh with you know one first one second and uh maze is going to i'm going to have him probably in the third spot with maybe a couple other horses uh late maybe a blazing sevens you know to i don't think i'm going any deeper than a try in this race because i'm not sure i can figure out the rest anything past the top three if i can figure out the top three mm. so uh National Treasure is my top pick with uh, with first mission very close behind. You heard him earlier with EJ's Nito stat of the night, sponsored by nobody. Here's uh, Ed DeRosa. Yeah, I, I got to try to beat this horse at, at a short price, like I said, against him two weeks ago at 15 to 1. And the reason I was against him is still in play <laughs> two weeks later. Uh, it's, a, it's a big ask. Uh, to do all this, uh, you know, in a four month time frame. So at the price, I'm going to take my shot knowing he, he can make me look foolish again. Uh, you know, if he, re if he repeats the Derby, he wins this race. So I'm basically betting that he doesn't, uh, but I, I do like the one and eight most. Uh, and I feel like perform underneath them uh, more so than red route one or blazing sevens, two other closers that I think the public's going to, uh, the public's going to gravitate toward is uh, the way to go. So, you know, if, if I'm fortunate enough to be in a spot to win a contest, a live money contest on Saturday, uh, I'll, I'll give away my strategy. I would be going all in uh, to have the one or eight win and perform underneath and a try and then just playing a bunch of, a bunch of combinations. And if I'm not in a contest, that's how I'll use my, uh, my ADW to try to win money on the race. Okay. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, and by the way, if you if you listen to the podcast and want to see what we've unfolded for you, you can go to YouTube as of Thursday midday. The YouTube Horse Racing Nation channel 
if you want to enjoy the hardcore handicappers visually. A lot of you did for the Derby, a record number for us, by the way. And when you do, I'm in fact, I'm looking down there at the finish line. Oh, there's Mark Midland right in front of the uh, finish line at Pimlico. So who's going to get there first on your ticket, Mark? Uh, maybe a little sentimental, but I'm going to stick with Mage. And uh, I, I do think uh, first mission is going to be very formidable. Um, so if I had to pick it, you know, one, two, three, I would say Mage over first mission. And, uh, you know, National Treasure is probably the third choice. But uh, just like kind of Ed's contest strategy there, and like I said before, I'm going to keep performing third under those horses and uh, keep in fourth under those horses. And depending on the price, I might be able to slide the six, uh, the five and seven and third um, with perform in fourth in the super. So uh, perform has to perform. That's going to be my main bet. And uh, we'll see. We have a lot of the same names. I'm not going to look past Mage, First Mission, and National Treasure. I'm going to add Perform, maybe for him to break up the party at the top. And so that might be my box play vertically in terms of the exotic on the Preakness. I want to thank you guys again. Like I mentioned, we'll uh, have you guys back again before the Belmont Stakes. So, uh, Johnny Avello, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And Ed DeRosa. The pleasure has been all yours. <laughs> you better believe it, baby. And Mark Midland. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Johnny, for joining us again. It's great. You're welcome. Thank you. Our guys. regular Friday episode will include our paddock Prince handicapper, David Levitt, super screener creator, Mike Shuddy, plus Baltimore turf writer, John Scheinman, and first missions trainer, Brad Cox. And uh, if I hustle just a little bit more, I think we'll get Mage's assistant trainer and co-owner, Gustavo Delgado Jr. Until then, this is Ron Flatter reminding you of uh, what the mutuals clerk asked Jay Trotter, who wanted to let it ride. Is it all there? Trotter said, well, I took out a little for the wife and a few things, but basically, yeah, it's all there. There you go.